The inaugural lecture is uh, one of the highlights of our academic calendar, both for the individual academic, for whom this often represents the, the acme of their uh, career, having spent decades sometimes uh, working, up, working their way up the academic ladder, <coughs> finally being promoted to professor, full professor, uh, and this inaugural lecture as a full professor uh, marks the achievement of that and is also an opportunity to reflect back on a body of work that has brought the academic to that point and uh, as you will see from the uh, lecture we're about to hear, uh, this, is, uh, this is really some achievement. But it's also an opportunity for us to come together as a community and to learn about each other and what each other does. So the inaugural lecture uh, is the, the, the directive to the, to the lecturer is not to give a highly technical lecture which uh, would be only of interest and understandable to other specialists in the field, the sort of lecture they might give at an academic conference. The, the mandate is to talk to other academics and to the public and the community uh, in a way that uh, shows, demonstrates both the interest and the relevance of the work to that wider community and brings us into that community. And it's an opportunity for us in different faculties and departments to learn about what our colleagues do and to help cement that community which we often that we don't often enough have opportunities to. So welcome and thank you for joining us and helping us achieve these twin goals. And the third goal is a, a way of uh, marketing the university, of saying to the community out there, the public, uh, here are some of our stars, of showing off uh, the work we do and the people who do it. And uh, again, uh, Professor Robinson Della, uh, it represents that. We're very proud of his work and of him and to have him as uh, a full professor in the university. I want to briefly introduce you to the platform party. Uh, I'm going to, in a moment, call up Professor Susan Bourne, who's the closest to me. Uh, she is the acting dean of the Faculty of Science, and she will introduce uh, Professor Robinson Della <coughs> sitting next to her. Um, next to her is uh, Professor Liz Langer, who is the new Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Teaching and Learning. <coughs> Next to her, uh, Professor um, Akeng, who is the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research and Internationalization. And uh, Professor Sophie Oldfield at the end of the platform, who will be doing the vote of thanks uh, after the lecture. So with that, I invite the Dean to introduce the speaker. Chancellor. It's an enormous personal pleasure for me to be the person who gets to introduce you to Professor Marlon Ramutsandela this evening. Um, Professor Ramutsandela, to tell you a bit about his background, um, was born and, and grew up in what's now called the Limpopo pro province. He tells me he was the second of seven, all boys, seven sons. Um, so that must have been quite an exciting um, story experience at least for his mother. <laughs> <laughs> so he grew up in, in, in what's now known as the Limpopo province um, and attended school there, including doing his secondary education at a school in Bafamadi, which unfortunately has been in the news just recently as one of the schools that was burnt down in, in 2016 as part of the student protests that have been going on. So again, just very topical um, in, in the world right now. Um, Mano went on to do his first degree at the University of the North, which has now, of course, become the University of Limpopo. And he completed his master's degree in geography um, while he was there. And he then won a Canon Collins scholarship to go and overseas and do his PhD in geography at the Royal Holloway at the University of London. And int interestingly, these days he's the vice chair of the Canon Collins Educational and Legal Assistance Trust, so paying back um, what he received. He returned to lecture at the University of the North before he took up a lectureship position here at UCT in 2001, in the middle of the year, in July, he tells me. And he says he remembers that year very well for reasons that we'll hear from him shortly. Really. Um, since 2001, then, he has risen through the ranks at UCT and he was promoted to professor in 2015. Professor Ramatandela has held short term positions overseas including the very distinguished Hubert Humphrey Chair at McAllister College in St. Paul in Minnesota. He's held a number of awards, 
including very importantly for us, the NRF Award for Transformation of the Science Cohort. He's published widely on peace parks, land reform, and borders, all very, very topical issues these days. <coughs> the publications include five monographs, two edited books, as well as a number of journal articles. He's very actively involved with both local and international professional bodies, such as uh, the International Critical Geography Group, he's an associate editor of the journal Conservation and Society, and a number of other editorial boards. So a scholar of great note. But on a personal note, um, within the science faculty, Martin Robotendela is very widely respected as one of the wise elders in our faculty. And I think partly in recognition of that, in 2017, he was appointed as one of the deputy deans in the faculty, which is a post he still holds. Milo doesn't speak very often, and he never speaks loudly. <laughs> but among, as, as with many others, I've come to realize that when he does speak, what comes out is a font of both deep wisdom, common sense, and a very deep sense of humanity. Um, Professor Ramatsandela has a remarkable ability to see through all the noise that is going on in the discussion, right to the heart of the critical issues that, that are being discussed. And I'm sure that that is also something that we will hear more of this evening. So it's a great pleasure for me to invite Mano Ramatsandela to come up and deliver his inaugural lecture. Okay, good evening, um, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank the Deputy, the, the Vice Chancellor, for inviting me to deliver this address, um, which I had hoped I would deliver it <laughs> on the 1st of November uh, uh, last year. And I had prepared it as a, as a blended lecture, because we're doing blended teaching at the time. <laughs> And I want to thank the, um, uh, the Office of the Vice Chancellor, um, Professor Paking, who is here, uh, Professor Lange, uh, my dean, and colleagues of the old field. Um, this is um, a moment which allows one to reflect back in one's life within a very short space of time. But it's also a moment that um, uh, it's exciting in the sense that for the first time you could give a lecture with your VC as a student. <laughs> um, I thought I should, I should tell you that when I joined the university um, in July 2001, um, it was one of the wettest winters in the Western Cape. <laughs> And one of my colleagues asked me whether I was in some ways related to the rainmakers in the Pompo. <laughs> but at least now I can have a very clear answer. <laughs> That's very dry, I'm still here. <laughs> that uh, perhaps we were not related. And if we were related, I have lost my powers. <laughs> but what I haven't lost is my interest um, in African conditions. And so the work that I'm going to uh, show you here today, or share with you today, um, is something that I have entertained um, for a long time. Um, as a student at the University of the North then, which is in some ways different from the University of Lipombo, I must say. <laughs> and um, I had the pleasure of uh, thinking about how South Africa's map is going to change with all the excitement that was in place. So I did my master's degree on how the internal borders of South Africa were going to change. And in my first interviews, I asked people, you know, where is change going to come from? And they say, well, you know, maybe it's not going to happen. What I found interesting at the time was when New borders were being drawn. The provinces, municipalities, there were a lot of contest about them. 
And this contest continues, even today. And, and so, so, so the idea of the map and how it organizes society became very important in my, in my research career. Um, I was not intending to work, do research in conservation at all. Um, so I came to study peace parks by accident. And accidents are very useful in science. Uh, you know, we know of, of stories of the apple falling and so forth from the tree. Um, and so I got interested in peace parks for one main reason, because it was claimed they were going to decolonize Africa. And they say, well, we've always wanted to do this. At least for the first time, we have the instrument to do so. And I entered the research on peace parks from a very positive side, um, as the new things that were happening, as, project, as a project that was supported by uh, people like uh, our former president Nelson Mandela, who was the patron. Um, and some of the names that I've come across now who were there, um, I thought maybe I shouldn't put them on the slides uh, for various reasons. But there were so many people who were interested in this project, which made me think it is, it is, worth, it is worth pursuing. They, they, it promised so much. And most of the scholars at the time wanted to know what these promises were. But there were also skeptics. People who saw the emergence of peace parks, these green spots that you have here, as, as something that is going to change the face of Africa. Um, and, and I will tell you, I'll, I'll give you a sense of where this comes from in a minute. But, but greening Africa became such an important aspect of the Peace Park project. Um, so I had to, uh, to, to think through this by way of going to these places, uh, partly enjoying them. Um, you know, I go to do field work in these places and you'll see some of the field work sites. Uh, when you get tired of teaching and the students um, have been demanding a lot, you say you're going to do field work and you disappear into this forest. <laughs> so they are, they are, they are some, some use, they are very useful for, for my research. Um, but I had to sort of, I had to go back to understand where they come from. Who wants them? Who drives them? What do they do? And, and those key questions were very useful for me. And so I came to the conclusion after doing my research since, the nine, since 1990, to, since um, 2001, actually. 2001, when I joined here, I just started doing my research. And one of the things that I have found now, which is very useful to talk about, is this, the peace parks are just one idea, but they've got multiple roots. So it is not somebody's idea. Um, and we know that there are names that are associated with the Peace Park. And I'm going to argue that the Peace Park idea doesn't come from those names. They've got a longer history. And I want to share with you some of this. I also want to argue that um, Peace Parks should be understood as part of conservation history and their geographic legacies. Um, have something to do with colonial conservation. So one has to go back to find out where these were located in the past and, and where they are today. And, and as we know, conservation was part of the partitioning of Africa. And we often forget about this because we're interested in saving the rhino, saving the animals, other animals, uh, especially the big, the big uh, uh, the bigger animals. But what is important is to understand the relationship between Africa and, and colonial conservation. Now, if we look at some of the historical maps, you might not be able to, to read the map on your left, but, but the title reads, Propose 
British National Parks for Africa. And so we might think that these national parks were delinked from the British Empire's uh, project uh, in Africa. And what happened in East Africa perhaps is more instructive. That you have in East Africa a concentration of British citizens. And in that concentration you also have the emergence of national parks. Now, if one th thinks of these as British national parks for Africa, where are African parks themselves? So, so, so one has to think about where they come from. And I also want to suggest that the sites where we see peace parks today were actually there in the 1930s. Um, so if we take this sites, of course this is a f our famous Kruger National Park. Um, and this will today be Gonarejo National Park in Zimbabwe. Um, my apologies for my friends in Zimbabwe. I've used Southern Rhodesia here. <laughs> that is what it was. <laughs> and, and so you have these parks beginning to crisscross cross the boundaries as early as 1935. Um, and I'm not suggesting that these, these boundaries, the, these, these areas here were meant to be the peace parks of today. The point I want to make is that the peace parks of today have their, have their seat in this colonial architecture of national parks for Africa. And, and of course, historians uh, can, can, can have uh, uh, some, some debates about this. But I want to show you uh, just how things have remained the same, both in 1935. This is a map of 1935. You see the border of the now uh, Lipompo National Park in Mozambique. It's exactly where it was meant to be. So there is no there's no difference in terms of the design of this. Of course, some of the areas have been cut off here, um, and the plans are actually to rebuild them again. So, so you have conservation areas in the 1935 that appear almost the same as the current peace park that we have. And so we cannot say these cross-border conservation areas are a post-1994 uh, phenomenon. We have to retrace um, their, their, their historical uh, lineage. And, and I'm not a historian, but I now have to go to the archives to try and dig out these maps so I can understand uh, what, what happened before. Okay, so if, if, if these areas remain the same, can we say that they are the ideas of people who are now financing them um, in, in 2018? Now, interesting back where these things come from, I had to go to some of the conservation projects um, that, were, that were in place. And one of the influential non-governmental organizations the Southern African Nature Foundation made a lot of uh, uh, progress in the region in terms of conservation. We might think that all national parks are where they are simply because we want to protect what was there. But if one reads the history of the Southern African Nature Foundation and the projects that it was involved with, one then realizes there are places that have now animals that had no animals before. That animals were actually translocated into where they are today. I'm sure you'd like to see some animals here, but I've left them out. <laughs> um, they, they, were, they, were trans, they were translocated um, to some of the sites that were um, in, the, in, the, in the view of uh, the Southern African Nature Foundation important for uh, building the conservation uh, uh, areas. 
And, and of course, this, the foundation was very much instrumental uh, since 1968 when it was founded to try and purchase more land for conservation. Now, some of these foundations are very, are very important ones. So if, if one takes, so this didn't come out well, but I'm sure you can see Rembrandt there. The Rembrandt group um, that was founded by Anton Rupert was, was, very, was very much influential in this. And, and of course you see uh, the investment by a, a group such as Rembrandt becoming involved in the translocation um, just to buy more land. But why were these foundations interested? Some of them were doing so as a gesture of faith in the future of South Africa. That's, that's very interesting. And I, I had to trace um, this foundation from 1968. And this is very interesting figures here. In 1968, uh, corporate that were members of this foundation um, were, just, were just above, above 50. And you see this, this invest this, this association growing. But it takes a dip at very critical periods in South Africa, uh, around 1976. But just towards the end of apartheid, there's a high level of involvement by the corporate in nature conservation. Well, if, if we had a crisis, we could say there was a crisis, but I couldn't find one. Um, what I found were companies that were investing, that were supporting conservation on the belief that this is supporting what South Africa's future might look like. Um, so at the height of the, part of the struggle against apartheid, we have got a steep increase in the number of corporate supporting conservation. I mean, there could be many reasons for this, but I'm just showing you what, what the data suggests. Now, another important factor to look at will be the end of the Cold War. Okay. Um, the end of the Cold War uh, saw a, a number of NGOs getting more involved in ideas of parks for peace. Um, the tourism industry also came on board to promote touring for peace. Uh, touring for peace for those who um, don't do a lot of touring in these areas, <laughs> would mean that when the tourists visit the areas, they can interact with the locals, um, give them some few things to eat if they are hungry. <laughs> um, and we saw that with the World Cup, uh, this touring where people will just go to the villages, give them some, uh, some, some football you know, to, to, to play around without worrying much about uh, uh, the future of, of, of the sports. And at the end of the Cold War, um, we also had a resurgence in, 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 in uh, discussions about African borders. Most African scholars uh, were, were, were arguing, and they still argue, that Africa is not free until we have removed the borders. Um, people like al Mazri were very much strong on this view uh, that we need to remove the borders in order to ensure that Africa is indeed free. And this was an opportunity to say we can actually remove the borders <laughs> through transferential conservation. Um, so so, so the, the, the history here is, is, is that once conservation found the social science language of decolonization, and I think this is very unusual, where, social, where natural scientists, for lack of a better word, let me describe them in that way, found the language in the social sciences that helped them do the natural science. Okay, it's not always, we, we always have this division. Uh, I'm in geography myself, and there's always some line between physical and human geographies. Okay. But at that point, it was very important to for conservationists 
promoting the Peace Park Foundation to take this political view of decolonizing borders as an important, as an important uh, statement. Um, and, and here you have people who are imagining about uh, these borders. Addison you know, wrote in one of the magazines, and this I found very useful, um, because it was comparing what Cecil John Rose did in Africa in painting Africa uh, British Red, and that with the Peace Park Foundation, sorry, with the Peace Park idea, we should have a map colored in green. But, but these maps came in two different colors. Okay. And this is the first map. The first map was really red and British red. And it appeared on the magazine in, 19, in 1996. Getaway uh, magazine that, uh, pop, you know, it popularizes places you need to visit before you die. <laughs> and now you, you have, so somebody warned the magazine, look, you can't make this, you can't use the red color. <laughs> That's not going to be acceptable. <laughs> and then they decided to use it, to use the green color. Okay? And that's why the map today, they're all green. Okay? But they start from this, this red color which is some ways following the ideology of the Cape to Cairo uh, connection. Okay. Um, now, what has happened with, with, with the Peace Parks uh, uh, project is that there, there is an attempt to move this, to connect these areas in, in some ways. And, and I found this in the Southern Southern African Institute of German Business. Okay? You see this map drawn by German business. It's not different from this map on conservation, okay, which is drawn by, uh, uh, by me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and <laughs> now, when you, when you compare these maps, what, what, you, you, you have got a sense that in the view of German business, well, this, this map should be connected to the future. Okay? And what we're looking at today are these separate national parks. But there's a view in the business sector that you know, we need this whole um, area to be, to be green. But let me give you some insights from the case studies themselves. Okay? This is just a broad stroke of, of, of what's happening. Just to emphasize my argument that it doesn't come from one source. It has got um, historical roots. But what is happening in the, in the, uh, in the areas where uh, Peace Park projects are being instituted? And we've got to think about perhaps the first one, which is the Kalakali on the Botswana South Africa border. Um, when, when this project was, when the Peace Park project was uh, uh, promoted, there was fear among the promoters of the idea about how South Africa, South Africans will receive this. And when doing field work in these sites, in the first few uh, uh, field work visits, people didn't want to talk to me. Um, because they were suspicious about what they're going to do with these ideas. And, and I'm also talking about officials here. They could only talk to me of the record for one hour, but it's useful, you know, things of the record. And you can't use things of the record <laughs> on ethical grounds, but at least it gives you some, 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 some context of, of what is happening. Okay, so the Kalakali is the first uh, uh, peace park to be established, and, and I would argue because it was the easiest one to establish. But it was important to establish this peace park between Botswana and South Africa, um, to quote uh, the promoters of the idea, to give faith into the Peace Park movement. Now, uh, I stumbled into this box uh, of coins um, in some of their carval sites. 2007 was the first decade of the Peace Park project. And a few coins in a nice box were made 
and sold to, I can't remember how many there were, sold to influential people. I only found these coins in, in Basel, Switzerland. Obviously, you can find things in Switzerland like this. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what is useful, what is, what, what is important perhaps to understand here is that the Peace Park project has got a very strong financial backing. Um, so you would have um, our Reserve Bank in South Africa printing these coins, and these were limited coins. Okay. Um, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't physically bring the coins, I could only look at the box. And, and leave them there. But that's quite useful. So what happens when you go to these places? Okay. And this, this, is, this is one of the fieldwork sites in the Kalahari. Um, and, and the person you see here is, uh, some of you would know, is, uh, is Om Davi, um, who, who is the leader of the Khoisan group. He was given a state funeral when he passed away, if I'm not mistaken. Am I right? Okay, so, so I'm used to teaching. I thought you were a sport. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you have, so I mean, these are, these are the students. You see two students, you know? I, I took them there to begin to understand what the Peace Park means for the Khoisan, uh, for the Komanisan uh, group. And actually, this was a very, uh, a very uh, useful trip for me because uh, the boma that you see here is the site of where uh, um, Davi was, was born. Um, but it is inside the park. On our visit in this place, we said, well, we've come to visit the Peace Park. And the question that they asked us was, whose, whose Peace Park are we talking about? And we, we, we were just, uh, we, we couldn't answer that question. Because this group owns the land on which the Peace Park is established. And they had visitors from Botswana, visitors from Namibia at, on that day. And they told us these visitors have to hide every, every time the tourist cars are driving towards them because the tourists don't want to see people. But this is, this is the area. And, and this brings back, perhaps in a, in, in a profound way, the question of, of land, which I will uh, bring it up uh, later. Uh, to see the implications of peace parks in as far as the land question um, that is concerned. Um, I'm, I'm not going to uh, bring in the quotes from Parliament on the expropriation and land question <laughs> that are taking place, but I'll, I'll approach the land question from, the, from a different point of view here. Okay. Um, so if, if I bring um, uh, perhaps a more useful side for us here um, is, 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 is this this area, um, which, is, which, is, which is the biggest now, but before perhaps we have a sense of what's going on in these circles, uh, we have one of the greatest places here which made me understand that peace parks are not simply about conservation. And this is Mapungubia, where there are no animals to preserve, but simply culture. So if, um, this, 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 is, this is the site of Mapungubia. Um, very nice, the Lipompo River there, uh, the Shasha River there, Zimbabwe is this, is over there, and we've got Botswana there, the small tail, and of course South Africa here. These are wonderful places, why would you go there? But, but if, if, you, if you begin to engage uh, the question of what's going on in this place with peace parks, you come to a realization that a number of ideas are mobilized to create this peace park. Just for a start, um, this is an ecological, um, an eco a map by ecologists uh, who would try to reestablish settlement patterns um, in, in the past decades or centuries. Now, these maps are becoming useful in driving the Peace Park project. Now, the argument is, oh, so we had this big kingdom. We can reestablish this big kingdom through a Peace Park. So, the work that ecologists are doing is feeding into other, other projects 
the Peace Park project in Mapungubye is based on archaeological findings. It is not based on any, any conservation of, of species per se, excuse me, although you have got some of this conservation taking place as, as early as 1924, uh, with Jan Smart trying to have uh, an experimental farm in that, in, that, in that part. So this is very old map. Um, as a matter of fact, um, as early as the 1940s, uh, this area was supposed to have been a peace park, a conservation area. Um, it was, there were suggestions that it should be named Jan Smarts as a uh, cross-border sanctuary. After the World War, so that Jan Smarts can come and rest there. Okay. <laughs> and and, and what, what became useful then was this archaeological map and, and I'll, I'll need to emphasize this because sometimes we think that these peace parks are about conserving biodiversity. Some of them are motivated on different grounds, including um, archaeology. Now, so this, this map here, um, which is an archaeological map, has been translated into a peace park. Um, and there's a memorandum of understanding between the three countries, Botswana, South Africa, and Zimbabwe, to have this peace park. And of course, it is now a heritage, heritage site. So that makes the area quite useful. But it is one of the peace parks that was initiated outside the conservation discussions. It has nothing to do with the environmental crisis or some climate change things. It might have something to do with the climate change in the past. Okay. But this is also an area where there are lots of land claims. Um, uh, on the South African side, of course, people can claim land, but not in Botswana or Zimbabwe. Uh, the different land, form, land reform programs. So in the South African side, you have got all these land claims. One of the discussions now is what to do with these land claims. Do you give people land, their land back in an area which is a peace park? And there's a pushback to these conservation areas. Uh, there's a pushback of land claims because they will interfere with the bigger projects. Okay. And, and, and here you have got a sense that the creation of peace parks will affect the way we do land reform in South Africa. And in fact, it has already uh, begun to show that um, in, in the case study that I'm going to show you. Now, this place, of course, is not just about, um, it's, it's not just about conservation. You have got one family which got the land back and they brought livestock with them. Uh, they are harvesting things, although they don't know where to sell them. Um, but in one of the interviews that I remember very well is that these people who live in the area, who have a land claim, are being asked to sell their land if they can. And they're adamant that they rather die rather than leave this land, lose this land. So there is, there is a concern about conservation in the Peace Park project and, and what, we, what we're beginning to see on the ground. But it's not only conservation that is resist, it's, it's not only then claimants who are resistant to um, to their land being taken over by, by a Peace Park project. You also have commercial farmers. Most of you who go to shop right checkers and things, you buy good tomatoes. Some of them come from here. Because the Lipompo River is, is, is a source of water that people use. It's a very fertile area. But on the Zimbabwean side, I should credit Innocence in Timure for sharing these pictures with me here. On the, on the Zimbabwean side, you've got people who, who own ranches, who are, who are also saying, we want to keep this because we can make more money. So there is, the, the equation of resource is beginning uh, to show up in, in these areas. But it is not only perhaps the locals that we need to look at in terms of what is happening with the Peace Park project. You might not be able to see this small flag here, and this, we're still in Mapungubye. Um, there's a small flag here, and this is the Botswana flag. In a small piece of land, which I've just shown you, Botswana hasn't taken down the flag. 
in that small piece of land. I mean, that small island. And actually, the whole project is, you know, this is a peace park, but I think it's beginning to create some discomforts. Um, and this is a very recent photograph. I need to go there this year to find out whether the flag is still there. But I, but I will, I'm, I'm just warning my uh, creditors in advance, I'm going to send it to have a claim for another field work here. But what, what is important is that while we're thinking about peace parks, there are all these contested terrain about resources. There are all these contestations over who owns what. And as a matter of fact, there is a big debate about whether this should be called Greater Mapungubia. Because if you call it Greater Mapungubia, it is on the South African side. Does it mean the South African, South African is South Africa is taking over some of the areas that belong to Botswana and Zimbabwe? Or do you need to change the names? And I think that flag will not come down until the name changes. <laughs> okay. But I need to show you some, some other uh, sites, um, you know, just to, to, to bring this map back. Um, one, one of the sites, one of the sites that, that I'm going to uh, uh, look at now is, is the Great, the great Lipompo. This was the premier project. Uh, the Peace Park idea was very much centered on this, that this, should, this should, should be a success story. It was to be the biggest animal kingdom in the world and so forth. But in order for this project to happen, you need to, you need to get presidents to sign. Um, in one of the Peace Park project, there was an idea that presidents could sit on the pontoon. This is the Orange River, or Kharip River. Um, you have got Namibia there, South Africa this side. And in signing the 2003 Peace Park agreement between South Africa and Namibia, there are stories that this pontoon was to be used uh, to carry the president right into the middle of the river so they can sign the papers and cancel the border. <laughs> but there were concerns that, well, if, if something happens, will they be able to swim there? <laughs> what they ended up doing is to get treaties signed in a very decent place. Okay? And here's this treaty of um, the Great Lipompo, which was Africa's rebirth. Uh, Mozambique. Mozambican president, Jacques uh, Chisano, former president uh, Tabombeki signing over there. And of course there is a ceremony to, 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 uh, to celebrate this. This perhaps was one of the biggest project uh, of the Peace Park because it brings uh, so many uh, um, players together. Um, you know, I think you will know, you recognize some of the people there. Uh, signing the treaties in 2002. I should emphasize that some of the treaties are signed even when there are sanctions against countries. As long as people can sign for Peace Park, um, and, and that, that applies to Zimbabwe. But it's not simply signing the Peace Parks. Once you have signed them, you, have, you send the documents. I've always wondered why do we have to sign the Peace Park? the treaties for peace, for parks. And why are African governments so much interested in signing the peace parks, treaties, when some of the older peace parks, such as the one between um, the USA and Canada, uh, which was there in the 1930s, but they never had a treaty. Why does Africa have to have a treaty? And I recently got an answer that we actually don't trust African governments. <laughs> They've got to bind themselves in order to get funding for this peace park project. And obviously what is interesting is people are happy to cut the fence once this, the signing has been done. And, and this was, a, was, was a, there, there were a lot of uh, stories about the signing uh, um, of this treaty and the release of the animals um, into Mozambique. 
And one of the interesting argument or story was that, I'm not sure whether it is an argument or a story, that these elephants that are in the Kruger were actually coming from Mozambique. And so we're just taking them back home. <laughs> but some of them actually came back and nobody wanted to talk about it. <laughs> because it simply said, you know, we, we, we belong on the other side. Okay. Um, and this is a cartoon that uh, perhaps captures what this signing did. You know, you have uh, the former president, Nelson Mandela, welcoming the elephants into Mozambique. But alas, the immigrants will also go, come through there. And I think that was a big concern. It is the main concern today with poaching. That Mozambique is blamed for poaching. Um, and, and so this, this gate have opened. Uh, we have cut down the borders, and we have got uh, this, this, this uh, 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 movement of people and animals uh, taking place. There seems to be a favor for animals moving across, but not for, society, for, for human beings. I think it is, peace. It, is peace. it is more peaceful for animals to move across. <laughs> Um, and and for, 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 wild, for, uh, for people to cross, we always have to have barriers against them. And I think that's perhaps one of the critical elements um, of, of the Peace Park Foundation. Oh, sorry, the Peace Park Project. <laughs> I keep saying the Peace Park Foundation. I think it's because they are the main funders of the Peace Park Project. Now, my interest in this now of late is what is the impact of this? on resources, on the ownership of resources. I mean, let's, let's go back and just... So, so when we have cut the fence and the animals are moving across, whose animals are these now? In fact, you denationalize the animals, the wildlife. You cannot claim the elephants as belonging to South Africa anymore because they, they, are, they belong to all the countries that have signed for this. And I think there is some kind of denationalizing uh, uh, wildlife uh, as, as, as a resource. Now, one of the interesting, one of these themes that interests me is the implications of this for, for, the, for land. Um, in the Kruger National Park, we have got these land claims. Um, only one of them uh, up here in Makuleke um, was successful and was uh, given the land back, the title back. Um, um, after the land claim. This, all these other land claims have stalled. And one of the reasons why they cannot succeed is that the Kruger is now part of the Great Lipompo. And countries have to respect the treaty to keep this as a conservation area. But on the Mozambican side, you also have people who were living in the area that is now the Lipompo National Park, who have been removed um, to, or resettled to some other areas. Um, there is a, an argument about whether they are resettled or whether they left voluntarily. Why wouldn't they leave voluntarily when the fence is cut and the animals are coming their way? Okay. So it's an induced resettlement of some sort. But going into these places is never easy. Uh, you get stuck. Um, and these young men are found later. They really make a livelihood from cars that get stuck here. <laughs> that I found later. Uh, they look very innocent, but they've got a mamba. They call them, it's not even wood, they call them mamba. I thought a mamba was a snake, but. Uh, they can always help you out. Um, and we found this as we were stuck. I couldn't, I, I couldn't communicate in Swahili, but uh, I was with um, um, uh, a co-researcher, Christine Noe, uh, doing this research. Um, and, and, and she overheard them saying, well, we should not let them struggle a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you want juice? No, that's what they said. <laughs> Don't you want juice? So, so, but what you find when you go to these places, when you go to this, you, 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 we, we wanted to understand how um, 
Tanzania is going to be connected to Mozambique through this Lu Game Reserve. And we found this very interesting aspect of communities being encouraged to create wildlife management areas. They have to do community mapping. Okay? And, and sometimes we like community mapping without worrying very much about what, the, pro, what the, the outcome is going to be. And this is how the map looked like. So local residents were being encouraged to decide areas that they would use for wildlife. And everybody was encouraged to decide in a particular direction. So people on this side should decide they, they need wildlife uh, on this direction so that you can create this corridor. There was one community that did not want to put their area on, on the right side. And they were reminded that this is, this is state land. And the president has said we need this. So it's, it's a very important uh, uh, project that sometimes when we involve locals, we feel we're doing a good job, but we could be doing a disservice to them. And what has happened in these areas is that you, over time, you have people losing their land uh, through this community mapping. Okay. Um, maybe let's, let's come to another uh, uh, area here, which is um, the biggest uh, peace park involving five countries. And just to give you a sense of how the land issue is developing uh, in, this, in these areas, should thank uh, Kelly, for pre Kelly Webster for preparing this map for me. Um, the original map of the treaty on the Utsana side had, this, had this, this, this boundary. But today when you look at this, the boundary has shifted southwards. The original boundary was there, it has moved here. So there is something about how these peace parks are in increasingly taking over some of the land uh, that, that belong to, to locals. Now, if you take Lesotho, you have the same situation. The initial border was this yellow line here, and there are people who are advocating the border should actually be this red line, which would mean half of the Lesotho becomes a peace park. And, 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 and so what, what, what is interesting for us, for me and my students, is to find out how is this border actually moving and how does it affect the livelihoods of ordinary people. Now, to go back to uh, uh, the great uh, area um, uh, involving five countries, you can see it's not going to be easy to put all this together into a conservation area. So what is happening is um, development, uh, what they call IDPs, integrated development plans, which would mean that countries should uh, develop these plans in order to put aside some of the land to be used for, uh, for conservation. And this is, I think, uh, the way in which the land question is going to uh, to be mooted. Because once people have developed these plants, they can use for grazing, land for grazing, uh, land for cultivations, and land for conservation. But there are critical areas that you cannot do without. So if you take, um, if you take some of these areas on the Zambian side, which are key to the creation of these bigger projects, Obviously, people have to either lose the land or change the land use. Okay. And this for me is it's, 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 it's interest, it's more important, because it tells us about the kind of peace that the peace parks are about, or the kind of peace that the peace parks are not about. So it becomes very useful to think through the concept of peace parks through this grounded, um, grounded uh, uh, research. The future of peace parks in Africa 
It's great, if I may put it that way. We're going to have more of this. <laughs> and hopefully we'll have more peace <laughs> on the continent. How will this come about? You can have, con you can have uh, conservation, and if you can't have conservation areas based on species, plants, and other things, what you could have is to go back to the cultural heritage sites. But make sure that you identify heritage sites that are on the borders. Because you need this to justify a cross-border conservation project. So the Africa's borderlands are becoming more useful in the creation of peace parks. Okay. Um, so if, if people are fighting over water um, in the Newland taps and things, <laughs> you know, you don't bring a peace park there. If that was at the border, then we will talk about a peace park because it allows the expansion of these areas. And I think this is, this is my view and I don't want to uh, predict the future, um, but there's no harm um, in identifying where the future is going to look like, what the future is going to look like and where peace parks are going to happen is in these cross-border cultural heritage sites. So um, those of you colleagues who are working on cultural heritage, um, are also doing a good job in laying the foundation for where the peace parks might go. I might sound like I don't like the peace parks, uh, but I have said I started on a positive note, and I really do enjoy going to this place. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure uh, most people will not mind being my research assistants. I've got research assistants with me here, my, my, my family, Daki, uh, Farisan, and Tihangui. They've been part of my research assistance, and I'm saying so because I need to submit an invoice. <laughs> uh, they, they've just been working without, without remunerations. And um, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for. I'm going to invite uh, Professor Sophie Oldfield to come and do the first panel. Thanks, and actually my colleagues also to come up to the come back to the panel. Thank you. It is uh, such an honour to give the vote of thanks for our dear and really exceptional colleague, Manu Ramazandela. He is, as you've noticed, a storyteller, uh, a man who spins together and seduces us with uh, humor, but really with the building and the crafting of very careful analysis. Analysis that links together powerfully processes of land and its politics, of conservation and its encroachments, and um, that really helps us think about the political economies, past and present. And really for me, as in a very exemplary way, um, brings together the micro geographies and helps us think about their macro political significance. So Manu has given us these really rich stories for thinking about our region and thinking about the continent. And I would just like to add a little bit of context for how this plays out in scholarly debates. And Manu's research on politics of borders, on land and nature conservation in peace, peace parks has really opened up new analytical terrain globally in thinking about political ecology and bringing it into close conversation with political geography. And he really, as you've probably noticed, leads the study of peace parks grounded in embedded in and inspired in African perspectives in the particular stories in various regional configurations and through the experiences which are colonial and post-colonial um, uh, experiences of navigating this politics of nature and politics of borders. And through this research, he makes a critical set of contributions to theories of the political ecology of the border, to work on borders and land and to work on political so he does this by deepening our understanding of the politics of nature and science and of its manifestation in nature conservation projects. Uh, through concepts such as, which really um, are what Max said inaugurals are not about, but through concepts such as political, um, such as scalar thickening and the concepts of the political ecology of the border, uh, of, the, of, the, of the border, he helps us understand the politics of land and conservation in conversations that don't easily normally converse. So this work has defined and now shapes a field 
it's critical nationally, it's, it's important socially and politically in our region, but it also has reframed a wider set of international political contexts. Manu's work, though, is always, however much is conceptual, it's more. And together with Ram Boucher in particular, Manu has developed a concept of green violence, a concept which helps us engage with why this work matters to us, to ordinary people, to policymakers, to citizens, to maybe prodding the consciences of philanthropists, um, and of course to scholars. Um, and so Manu's work on peace parks has become a really important reference in the Southern African region and beyond. So he is a scholar, he creates debate, he helps us think critically about how we move forward at a national, at a regional, at a continental scale. And, but Manu's presence in, in UCT and beyond is many, many things. It's global. Uh, I could add a lot to um, Susan's initial comments about his um, really significant role, uh, his inaugural guest position at the University of Geneva last year, his significant keynotes in various institutions in Europe and in the US. Um, he has been invited, for instance, to publish in the New York Times and to be uh, part of an international group of experts. Um, and we could spend a lot of time running through his CV, but the place where I would like to um, come to is actually about his impact here. And I'd like to speak about three, three impacts. Manu has made a, a massive and a really powerful impact on students. And I've had the pleasure of teaching with Manu in our first year course in the Department of Environmental and Geographical Science for 15 years. And I have had really the pleasure of both learning from him and um, benefiting from his uh, rigor and his care, his inspiration, the ways in which his work opens up worlds to students, helps them think about critical scholarship with public impact. Uh, he has, in particular, shaped a, a, a whole, I would even argue, generation of postgraduate scholars, people who are following in his footsteps on the continent, uh, really a brilliant uh, group of scholars who are shaping the future direction of political ecology and of work on the politics of nature and science. I'd like to add a thanks from on behalf of my department, uh, the Department of Environmental and Geographical Science, for the ways in which um, your work, Manu, has set standards, has um, constituted a rigor and a care and a commitment to the scholarly project anchored in the ways in which we work here and the debates which shape the ways in which we are working as a university. And lastly, from my side, I'd like to also mark the role that Manu has played in the Society of South African Geographers, a national body where he has really um, been a pillar in our field, setting standards and expectations for which and to which we aspire. So lastly, in my vote of thanks, on behalf of Manu, uh, I would like to thank his family, his wife, Takalani, his daughters, Farasani and Tehanli, um, and his brother, Peter, his big brother, Peter, um, for all their support and love, and for the really absolutely central role you've played in, in, um, in the work that Manu's done and the position that he has held and, and has uh, created here. Uh, Manu would also like to thank Sipo Talani for laying the foundation as his lecturer and for his scholarship at the University of North and a colleague that some of us know, David Simon, for his belief and his PhD supervision at Royal Holloway at the University of London. He would like to thank Cannons Collins Trust for financing his studies when all other doors were closed and to thank the Department of EGS for the space to pursue his research interests and for the support. And most of all, he'd like to thank all his graduate students, many of whom I can see, for always keeping him on his toes. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Oldfield, for that lovely vote of thanks. And uh, let me just echo those thanks. And a congratulations to Manu, and say again, you've enjoyed that very much, you've done us proud today. Uh, the platform party will, will now leave, but we'll be upstairs, and I hope that you'll join us outside just to 
Krishna, and congratulations to Professor Ramasinghe. Thank you all very much for coming.